Yesterday on the way home from picking up my son, I talked to him about the Inspiration4 launch and how it was an amazing moment for us, you know, in the United States, humanity, you know, really it's a huge moment in history. And he was kind of <laughs> so-so about it and said, you know, why does this really matter or anything? And what's the big deal about going to orbit? And I kind of explained to him why it's such a big deal going to orbit. And I think I blew his mind a little bit, but then I went on to explain why Inspiration4 is so important. And, you know, what people often, a lot of people have actually said, this is no big deal. Inspiration4 is just kind of a publicity stunt, but really, yeah, you could take that attitude a little bit, but long term, this is a hugely important historical moment. And the launch last night not only demonstrated that SpaceX is just astounding because they're able to do this like clockwork with no problems, right? It looks so easy when they do it, but not only that, this really does open up the door for the future. Let's take a look. For those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I first want to start by kind of admitting something, which is that I really haven't even, I started to watch the Netflix special yesterday. Number one, I've just been really busy, but number two, I have, uh, well, part of me is like, I really hate those kind of Olympic stories. <laughs> they always do that stuff when they do the Olympics about how this person's, you know, dad or mom drove them 50 miles uphill in the rain and the snow, uphill both directions to some gym so that they could work out and like, you know, get into the Olympics or something. Those sort of sob story, feel good stories, I, I don't know. I've just watched them too many times and so I've become sort of like immune to them. Uh, it turns out that actually the Netflix special is, is quite good and I started watching it on people's recommendations. But the other reason why I didn't watch it was because of just abject jealousy. I have wanted to go to space. I wanted to be an astronaut. I mean, that was the first thing. If you ask my parents when I was a very, very small child, uh, I used to say I wanted to become an oceanographer, which actually meant I wanted to be a scuba diver, and I became a scuba diver, so that's really cool. Uh, but as soon as I was sort of aware of space, I wanted to become an astronaut. And that actually happened when I was about four years old. This is actually the first memory no, the second memory. I had a, a few memories before this, but I was just shy of four and a half years old when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, and I have a very definite memory of that. In fact, the memory is my parents being super pissed off and trying to get me and my brother away from the TV. Uh, they were not huge television watching people. They weren't the kind of people who are like, get out of the way. So it was one of those things that registered in my mind. I was like, why do they care about this so much? There's like this grainy black and white picture. You can't tell what the hell's going on. You can barely see it's a person. But then in my little four-year-old brain, it started to click together that this was actually a really big deal. And from that moment on, I mean, honestly, so I was four, it was 1969, and I'm now 56 years old, and I have never stopped loving space. I, I, you know, I wanted to go into space since I was that age. I almost went into the Air Force Academy uh, graduating from high school, but I got into Princeton and figured that getting a physics degree from there was a better idea. Plus the fact I'm kind of a pacifist and didn't really want to, uh, you know, go fly airplanes, which was the only real route to becoming an astronaut apparently at the time. Now, of course, the Cold War was ending very complicated, so whatever. But anyway, you know, it, it seemed like physics was the next best route and to become a physicist and an engineer and work towards the astronaut group at that point. When I went to graduate school and changed my major, my degree, I actually went to graduate school at Ohio State in physics and switched over to English. And that was the point where I sort of gave up my dream. And so, you know, that was like 1987, 1988. And it was, it was an important moment for my life and it was good for my life's trajectory, but it was a very, very sad moment for me because I gave up this dream in my mind that I thought I would never get to space. Well, it turns out I'm, you know, <laughs> halfway, halfway to 60 right now in this decade, and maybe if things work well, I mean, I don't think I personally will ever have the money, but there will be people like me who have more money and will be capable of doing something like this. I definitely, I, you know, I gave a whole bunch of money to St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital, which is a very, very worthy cause, and signed up and right over here somewhere. I don't 
don't think I can. It's like over there. Yeah, like there is my inspiration for patch. I'll put up a little picture of it here. So I definitely tried, um, you know, Warren Redlich this morning on Twitter actually joked about the fact that he was like, because I tweeted and said I would trade places with any of these people right now before the launch. And he said, sure, after they're already in space and everything is looking good. And I was like, no, actually, the, the kind of danger is part of the appeal. And I don't know how many people know this, but I actually have a sister channel to this channel, Whole Nuts and Donuts, which has been around since 2012. <laughs> it actually started with my dog, with my husky Lily, and so it used to be called Lily. Um, but that was what the channel was called. But we changed it to Whole Nuts and Donuts because I like to do crazy things that put my life at risk and put my comfort definitely out the window and kind of drag my wife along with me. So anyway, if you're interested in that, I did a Mount Rainier climb. Uh, it's actually quite popular and it's, um, you know, one, the best sunrise I've ever seen in my life was from there. So when in the Netflix special, they talked about them going and climbing Mount Rainier, I was like, oh yeah, been there, done that, no big deal, right? That wasn't even the biggest one by all means. Uh, climbing Loboshay Peak in Nepal was a much bigger thing. That's a 6,000 meter peak. And Mount Rainier is about 4,400 meters, although Mount Rainier is a really good warm-up climb for Mount Everest, I guess. Anyway, so those videos are up there if you're interested. And that channel sadly only has, I think, 860-something uh, subscribers after nine years on air. So if you want to go take a look and you think that they're really cool videos, you should definitely subscribe. It'd be nice if that thing had a few more subscribers. Uh, I'm going to do a Half Dome video one of these days because I climbed that last summer. That was just, you know, a quick day hike kind of thing. No big deal. But I, I think that would be really cool to share with everybody. I just, <laughs> this channel and teaching and everything has taken up a lot of time. So it'll probably be a little bit, maybe Thanksgiving break or something. I'll have time to work on that. Anyway, a lot of stuff. Let me get back to it. This was supposed to be a super short video. I just don't seem to be able to do short videos about space. Um, so what I was explaining to Hayden, my son, on the way home at the beginning that blew his mind was he was like, well, just going to space is like going straight up. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. That takes a tiny amount of energy, right? If you look at the booster that separates from the second stage, and I'll put a little clip up here, when they separate, that booster's going just shy of 6,000 kilometers an hour. So it's going, you know, and it's into space. It's well into space. It goes very, very well past the Kármán line. But then that second rocket, the second uh, stage has to burn for about you know five more minutes, I think, after the, the separation. It is a very long burn and it has to get up to over 25,000 kilometers an hour. So it's really, really fast. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it's about 20 times the speed, 20 times faster than a, a bullet that leaves a gun or something, right? So anyway, that blew his mind, the fact that it's not going up. I said, it doesn't matter how far up you go, you're going to fall back down again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you get close to where the moon's gravitational pull is, whatever. But basically, you need to go sideways really, really fast. And that's the reason why these rockets are so impressive. And the fact that everybody's like, oh, they're in orbit now. Everything is safe and sound. No, they're going to, you know, 27,000 kilometers an hour around the planet planet. 15 times a day, they're going around the planet. They're going really fast. If they hit anything or if anything goes wrong, they're in really, really big trouble, right? So the fact that SpaceX is able to make this all look so easy is a credit to Elon Musk. It's more of a credit even to all of the people who work for him who, who have made this all just an incredibly amazing company. I really wish that they'd go public. I don't want them to go public because I love the fact that they're able to do what they want to do, but I really wish that they would at least allow some private rounds of funding because I would love to be able to be involved in the company in some way. But anyway, the physics of being in orbit is a really amazing thing and the speed that they're going and the fact that if they hit anything, a tiny grain of sand, or if their you know, retro rockets or something don't work, they don't come back down again, right? They don't get to, they don't, it doesn't just decay naturally in a day or two, it would take, especially because they're actually higher than any human being has been in orbit since the 1960s, which is incredible, right? Higher than the ISS, higher than the uh, Taikonauts right now, um, you know, higher than anybody has been since the 60s when we were getting ready to go to the moon and the Russians were doing the same thing, the Soviets were doing the same thing. Uh, also, it's the most people in space, in orbit at least, at any one time, I think, ever. 14 people, so it's amazing. I think it's seven on the ISS, three Taikonauts aboard their space station, and then the four Inspiration 4 crew, which is just incredible, right? So, wow, that's an amazing, you know, feat as well. All right, so there we have some of the, you know, physics involved in taking off. And by the way, SpaceX, I would love, there's, um, I love your statistics and everything that you show when you do your live stream. 
but I would love to have like an arrow, just a little arrow that showed the direction of the spacecraft while they're going. So as it goes, right, it would start off like this because it's pointing up, but as soon as they clear the tower, basically, it tips over. And it would be really cool, like, right, we see the speed that they're going, but not the vector of the speed. And I would love to see the vector of the speed, which is the direction it goes. So I would love to be able to see this thing go like this and tip over as it gets up. And when you see a human rated spacecraft launch, they go very, very shallow. So they burn at a lower amount. They don't speed up as fast because they stay in the lower atmosphere longer. And the reason why is they don't want to get up to a very high speed and then go into a ballistic drop because there's not enough atmosphere to slow the capsule down when you're up that high. So it would be going screaming fast and it would kill everybody. The G-force would kill them and potentially the uh, spacecraft would burn up as well. So what they do is they stay at a very shallow arc and then slowly raise that over time. So it's a much shallower like flight path to get to orbit than doing like a cargo run or something where they go up much more quickly and then turn sideways. So anyway, a little interesting tidbit. Another tidbit for those who don't know is that the booster and the Dragon capsule were are both reused. That's an incredible thing, right? We're launching civilians into space. I mean, SpaceX is I got to give them, you know, they're ballsy as a company. They're launching civilians into space. This thing had to work and it worked without a hitch. Very beginning of the launch window. No big deal, right? Just went off like that. But also they're flying used craft to put these people into space. That is incredible confidence in their technology. Uh, the two parts that weren't reused are the second stage and the trunk of the Dragon capsule, which gets... Um, ejected just before they re-enter the atmosphere and that burns up. So both of those things burn up in the atmosphere relatively quickly after well, the launch and then the landing. Uh, so anyway, but the, the main two components, the Dragon capsule and the booster are both reused. So that's amazing. So, okay. <laughs> so onto the point, why is this important? Why does this matter for the future? Isn't this just a publicity stunt? So first of all, to some extent, I guess you could argue that this is a publicity stunt, but Jared Isaacman is an extremophile, right? He's the person who loves to do extreme things. It doesn't appear at, you know, at least what Jordan Wright, the angry astronaut talked about, and I thought this was really informative. He's not so much into space. I'm into space. I love extreme things as well, but space is the most important, most extreme thing that I could imagine doing. For Jared, it seems like this is another in his collection of things. And right, if he was, if I was a billionaire, I would spend all my money going to space and trying to make that happen. He obviously likes to do a lot of different things. And so he, you know, wants to collect these sort of extreme events in his life. And good for him. That's amazing. And it's really cool that he's doing this. But he's also paying for this privately. And, you know, the fact that he's being allowed to do this by the United States Federal Aviation Administration, um, you know, and SpaceX is being allowed to do this. The fact that the United States has opened up to tourism like this. And yes, you know, we've had tourists before, but it's been a very expensive prospect and very, very limited. Uh, Dennis Tito, if I'm remembering correctly, was the first tourist in space and he was on the ISS. Uh, this is an entirely separate thing. They're not connected to the International Space Station at all. They're in a much higher orbital plane than the International Space Station. They're just doing this on their own. And what it means is, and I, who knows exactly how much money this thing cost, but let's just throw out a number of like $70 million or something that he paid SpaceX. And, you know, given what their launch costs and stuff and launching a reused rocket and all of these kinds of things, it might not be too much more than that. So for a billionaire, this is, it's a big chunk of change for anybody, but it's not out of the question that there are a big number of people who could do this in the world. Uh, and so there, and especially because he didn't just invite, you know, <laughs> he didn't invite his girlfriend and his mom and dad, right, on this thing. He did a contest to raise awareness, to, to fundraise for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. I think these are like amazing things that he did. I, very much kudos to him for doing this um, and raising a lot of money. And I believe the live stream that SpaceX had last night was also fundraising as well. So, you know, just really cool that all of this was going on. So that part is really neat. But for the future, I think that what this does is number one, it clears the decks because anybody else who wants to do this now and, and you know, I, probably in the future, there might be people who do invite their, you know, girlfriends or boyfriends or parents or children or whatever, right? You could have a family launch. That would be a pretty wild thing that you could have mom and dad and two kids, right? And plus their dog or something on this thing. Uh, so that you could do something like that in the future if you wish to. That opens that up. But beyond that, it, it allows people to dream again. And I think that's the part. And I, you know, the everyday astronaut Tim Dodd uh, cried during part of his live stream last night. 
I think part of that is the realization for people that are, I'm older than him by a good chunk, but for people who are around our age, we grew up in the sunset of the first space era, the thing where everything was kind of collapsing back down to a smaller vision. There was that grand vision that came along when I was born, it was halfway done, right? The, the, the Mercury, the Gemini, and then the Apollo missions. And by the time I was really aware of what was going on, it was sunsetting. It was by 1972, we didn't go back anymore. And for the longest time, I thought I would die before anything ever happened again. And it would just, it, it would be something that was this beautiful shining moment of, of accomplishment and positiveness in the world. There's so much negativeness in the world that this moment that we're seeing again, and in a way that seems more sustainable in a way, because it's being funded by private citizens and it's being run by a private space company, it's not dependent on governmental entities anymore. And that opens up the world again. And even as old as I am, I can still dream that maybe someday somebody would invite me on one of these things or I'd win a contest or something. I will never have the kind of money to be able to afford it myself. But to be able to do that, is something that is just like, I don't know, it makes me tear up just thinking about it. And maybe someday, you know, I, I could never afford the orbital thing because it's just too expensive, but maybe like the Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic, I really like the Virgin Galactic flight profile with the plane and all that's really, really cool. But maybe I could eventually afford something like that, right? It couldn't do it right now, it's too expensive. But if the prices come down, uh, you know, and you know, Sir Richard Branson is not a young whippersnapper. So the fact that he was able to get up there and do that is pretty cool. Uh, so, so anyway, I can dream about that, at least maybe, you know, touching the edge of space for a moment, going into orbit for three or four days and being able to actually perform valuable experiments for the world that, <laughs> gosh, I'm having a hard time talking about this. That would be something that would make me so, um, <laughs> that that would be, like I said, that, that would be my dream come true. I think I would have a life that was well lived if I could do that. So anyway, I'm going to end this now because I can tell that I'm just getting emotional about this. Uh, thank you for being along for this kind of long winded chat about everything. Uh, I hope that there are some of you out there that agree with me about this and really feel like this is something that is valuable. And I hope for people who are kind of like, meh, whatever, this wasn't that big a deal, that maybe you'll think about, yeah, actually, I think this is a big deal and maybe it'll make you you know, rethink things a little bit. And of course I had to wear my <laughs> Tesla Rockets for the People shirt today. You can find that in the, uh, in the merch store if you're interested. Anyway, thank you all so much for being along with this ride for me and for being along in the ride with the channel. I know I mostly talk about Tesla and everything, but I thought it was very worthwhile talking about SpaceX. I'm a huge, huge space fan and a huge SpaceX, you know, fan as well. Uh, and by the way, just as a little preview, tomorrow I am, have the privilege of talking with Anastasia in tech about the Dojo hardware. She is a hardware engineer and she has her own YouTube channel and stay tuned for that tomorrow. Definitely subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, all of that good stuff so that you're aware of when that comes along. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. And I think there's a lot of you who are at least as enthusiastic about this as I am given the Discord discussions that we've been having lately. And of course, if you're interested in joining the club, you can definitely check out the link in the description. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And don't forget about our merch store, which now has physics is the law, everything else is a recommendation, which is a quote by Elon Musk, as well as other t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, etc., etc. Check it out in the description. And finally, don't forget we are both tech Tesla and Amazon affiliates. I wish we were SpaceX affiliates too, but anyway, for now, Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you check out the links in the description, you can see how going shopping for a Tesla, a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. And as always, don't forget that you can ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.